The Vicar of Maidley, the Reluctant Saint of Methodism. John William Fletcher has often been referred to as the first theologian of Methodism. He was perhaps most known for defending John Wesley's position of Arminianism against the Calvinistic influences that were present in the early Methodist movement. He was the man that John Wesley had handpicked to be his successor after his death. Wesley believed that Fletcher was the only one who was qualified to act as his replacement. Unfortunately, Fletcher, who was significantly younger, died six years before Wesley. He was an interesting character that has been largely forgotten, but his influence in Methodism should not be ignored. So join us on this historical episode of the Methodical Methodist Podcast as we explore the life and ministry of John William Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Methodical Methodist Podcast. I'm your host, the Reverend Andrew Lay, and if you like this show, I hope that you might take a minute to subscribe, rate, and write a review for the podcast. It helps boost the show and make it to where more people can find it. You can also find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash methodicalpod, and you can find me on Instagram as well. My handle is at methodicalpod, so be sure to check me out. I want to announce that I have written an Advent book entitled Hope for the Holidays, Exploring the Message of Hope in the Christmas Story. The book talks about how hope is vital to our lives and it's often most prevalent during the season of Christmas. So my book speaks about the message of hope that we find in the Christmas story as we celebrate Jesus' birth. In the book, I explore the ways that we can experience hope for the holidays. Each chapter looks at different characters in the Christmas story and how they offer a message of hope to us in our own lives. Hope for the Holidays is now available on Amazon. You can also find it at Cokesbury. And if you live in Athens, Tennessee, you can pick it up at White Street Market. So I'd love for you to check it out and leave a review. From an early age, John William Fletcher was considered a model of sanctification. In an early biography, one historian says, From his childhood he was impressed with a deep sense of the majesty of God and a constant fear of offending him. His filial obedience and brotherly affection were exemplary. Nor is it remembered that he ever uttered one unbecoming expression. John Fletcher was born on September 11, 1729. I've seen conflicting reports. It might have been the 12th. But he was from the Swiss town of Nyon in Lake Geneva, and he was the youngest child of five girls and three boys. Apparently he was pretty stubborn and short-tempered as a child. In a letter he wrote about his childhood, Fletcher said, I've often heard from my friends that were never a child producer more passionate and stubborn than me from the cradle. But it seems like he had a deep and convicting conscience. He described one event when he was seven years old, and he was extremely angry with one of his brothers, and he had been sent to bed early as a punishment. And he stewed in his room, and then he began to feel guilty for fighting with a sibling. And then he started to worry that he might be sent to hell and find eternal punishment. So he spent the night crying and weeping, and his heart started to soften as he slowly realized that God wasn't mad at him, but God had forgiven him. And it was at that time, at seven years old, that he devoted himself to God and the church. He described this event as his first conscious expression of the love of God. Fletcher studied in Geneva in the Faculty of Arts. There he most likely studied classical Greek and Latin authors, history, geography, church history, physics, mathematics, and philosophy. At first, Fletcher was pursuing a career in the church, but then he started having second thoughts. He broke off his theological studies in Geneva in 1747 or 48 because he felt unworthy of serving as a minister. 
Another reason was that he disagreed with the prominent Calvinistic theology that was so prevalent in Geneva, the old stomping ground of John Calvin himself. After some time, he changed course from theology to, wait for it, military studies. So yeah, that's a pretty big change. But Fletcher was greatly influenced by a number of his friends and relatives who had chosen careers in the military. His uncle and one of his brothers were serving in the military at the time. Fletcher had geared up and was ready to serve in Germany, but a peace treaty that occurred on October 18, 1748, prevented any chance of joining an army. So Fletcher had to return home, disappointed with his plan of serving as a military officer unrealized. So Fletcher was lost. He had no plan, no way forward. He wanted to escape his situation. And he was offered a job to go overseas as a maintenance man on a trip to Brazil in 1749. Before he started off on the journey, a super bizarre thing happened. Someone dropped a pot of boiling water on his legs. And so his legs were completely scalded and scorched. And so he had to stay put and recover from this horrific injury. And when he finally did recover, his uncle, who was an officer in the Dutch army, had a post waiting for him in Holland. So Fletcher goes, he's super excited, but when he gets there, he just waits around in vain for his appointment, and nothing ever comes from it. And then his uncle just up and retires and pretty much just leaves him high and dry. So Fletcher gives up on his military aspirations, and finally in 1750, he heads for jolly old England instead. Fletcher spoke French, but he had learned how to speak English during his time in school. And while studying to improve in English at a boarding school in Hatfield, Hertfordshire, he started working as a private tutor for the Hill family at the age of 23. And it was while working for the Hill family that Fletcher heard the name Methodist for the first time. Fletcher had come across a poor woman in need. He had saddled up a horse to go and help the woman. But another lady told him not to go. She said, people will say that we have got a Methodist preacher with us. Fletcher asked what she meant by that. She told him who the Methodists were. Fletcher responded that he would be one of them if there really were such a people in England. The Hill family tolerated Fletcher's religious piety, but the idea of him adopting Methodist practices was a ludicrous thought. Nevertheless, Fletcher immediately sought out these people called Methodists. He attended Methodist services, listened to Methodist preachers, and joined a Methodist society. At this point, the Methodist movement was only about 15 years old and had already grown and developed quite a bit throughout England. Around this time, Fletcher went through a significant conversion experience. He had struggled with the notion that God was angry, wrathful, and full of judgment. He would have nightmares about going to hell. Eventually, he came to feel an assurance of God's mercy and grace. About seven months after feeling this assurance of salvation, Fletcher wrote an extensive covenant with God. It goes on for about 98 lines. I'm not going to read it right now, but it is worth checking out if you're interested. Fletcher began to seek John Wesley's advice about whether or not he should seek ordination, saying, As I look upon you as my spiritual guide, and cannot doubt of your patience to hear, and your experience to answer a question proposed by one of your people, I freely lay my case before you. Unfortunately, we don't have Wesley's reply, but we can assume that it must have been positive, because John Fletcher was ordained a deacon on March 6, 1757, by James Beauclerk, the Bishop of Hereford, and the Anglican Church. Then, just a week later, on March 13th, he was ordained a priest by the Bishop of Bangor. Then the following day, on Monday, March the 14th, Fletcher was installed as the curate in Maidley, Shrapshire, which is about 10 miles from the Hill family estate. He was essentially the assistant priest to the Reverend Roland Chambre. Almost immediately, Fletcher began assisting John Wesley and the Methodists. Wesley had been ill, and Fletcher had stepped in a few times to help him. John Wesley writes about this, saying, Mr. Fletcher helped me again, 
How wonderful are the ways of God! When my bodily strength failed and none in England were able and willing to assist me, he sent me to help from the mountains of Switzerland, and a help meet of me in every respect. Where could I have found such another? Charles Wesley had also become very good friends with Fletcher. In one letter, John Fletcher wrote to Charles, saying, I sense that I do not deserve your advice, much less the title of friend which you give me. You are an indulgent father to me, and the title of son would fit me much better than that of brother. You ask me if I can confidently commend you to the mercy of God. Oh yes, I can, and I feel in relation to you what I do not sense for myself. Fletcher continued his involvement with the Methodists, and then on October 4, 1760, he was officially nominated as Vicar of Maidley. John Wesley was completely against this decision. He was afraid that the solitude of Maidley would become too much of a temptation for Fletcher. Wesley wanted to keep him as a close colleague and advisor in London. By this time, Charles Wesley had retired to Bristol and was living life as a family man. John Wesley saw Fletcher as someone who might act as a partner in leading the people called Methodists. In fact, John Wesley was prepared to offer Fletcher joint leadership alongside himself and was even ready to take second place under Fletcher. But Fletcher took the position as the vicar of Maidley. It is estimated there were around 1,000 to 1,500 people in the parish at the beginning of his ministry there. But it didn't take long for the people in his parish to criticize his Methodist preaching style. He was very active, offering communion and multiple services and sermons a week. He tried to preach to the whole population, traveling around, going to where the people were. But he upset some folks in the church when he preached against drunkenness after people were drinking wine at the annual fair in Maidley. It seems like his time there was full of highs and lows, but Fletcher took on a role as president of Triveca, a college that was opened on August 24, 1768, and this was meant to be a place of theological training, funded and supported by a rich countess, a Methodist woman named Lady Huntington. But around this time, there were growing tensions in the Methodist movement, particularly around Wesley's criticism of Calvinist Methodist clergy. John Fletcher took on a vital role in this debate. You can find out more about the Calvinist branch of Methodism in episode 37 about George Whitfield. In this debate, Fletcher clearly took the side of John Wesley he picked up his pen and began writing in favor of Arminianism, this idea of free will. Fletcher often addressed the false claims that were hurled at Wesley. Fletcher really became a theologian, upholding Arminian doctrines and speaking out against Calvinism and defending John Wesley. He also wrote about entire sanctification and is really credited for the development of the Pentecostal theology in early Methodism. John Wesley and John Fletcher really influenced one another in their writings, and Fletcher really became a systematic theologian for Methodist theology. By 1770, John Wesley was nearly 70 years old. Ten years earlier, Wesley had asked Fletcher to take over the leadership of the Methodist movement, but Fletcher had declined. Wesley knew that he was getting old, and he wouldn't be around forever. Wesley offered the invitation once again, and once again, Fletcher declined. Again, three years later, in 1773, Wesley called upon Fletcher to become his successor yet again. Wesley wrote to Fletcher saying, But God has provided one so qualified. Who is he? Thou art the man. God has given you a measure of loving faith and a single eye to his glory. He has given you some knowledge of men and things, particularly of the whole plan of Methodism. You are blessed with some health, activity, and diligence, together with a degree of learning. And to all these, he has lately added, by a way none could have foreseen, favor both with a preacher and the whole people. 
Fletcher did not want to take leadership of Methodism. He would really rather be a co-worker to Charles Wesley, whom he thought should take charge. Still, John Wesley persisted as his health continued to decline in his older age. And in 1776, however, Fletcher did agree to at least accompany Wesley on his travels. But Fletcher began to have some health problems of his own. He had issues with his voice, and people in his church would remark at how abnormally quickly he had aged. By 1778, at the age of 48 years old, Fletcher was seriously ill. He traveled to southern France with the hope that the mild climate would help improve his health. And then he spent about three years in Nyon resting and trying to improve his health while still taking different trips here and there to preach. In 1781, Fletcher returned to England, and he picked up a correspondence with a woman that he had met 30 years earlier, Mary Bosanket. Mary was a woman who had convinced John Wesley back in the early 1770s to allow women to preach. So Mary was one of the first women preachers authorized by John Wesley to preach in public. John Fletcher had liked her and admired her since they had first met. In fact, around 1776, Fletcher had actually stayed at her house so that she could act as his nurse when he was in particularly poor health. They had corresponded several times over the years, and they finally admitted their feelings to one another. And then on November 12, 1781, Mary Bosanket and John Fletcher were married in Batley Church. They were great partners in marriage and in ministry. Mary often traveled with John and took care of him as his health continued to decline. In 1783, they traveled to Dublin so that John could preach and visit the Methodist classes and prayer meetings there. And then in 1784, Fletcher went to the annual conferences of the Methodists. There he preached several times and assisted John Wesley in distributing the Lord's Supper. Sadly, by the end of 1785, Fletcher's health had taken a turn for the worse. He had caught a cold and was very weak. He had a high fever, little energy, and his voice grew weaker and weaker. His body was covered in spots. And then during the night of Sunday, August the 14th, 1785, John William Fletcher died at the age of 56. The funeral took place three days later and was led by an old friend, the Reverend Hatton. On November 6, 1785, John Wesley held a memorial service for Fletcher in London. In his sermon he said, Many exemplary men have I known, holy in heart and life, with fourscore years, but one equal to him I have not known, one so inwardly and outwardly devoted to God, so unblameable a character in every respect I have not found either in Europe or America. And it is possible we all may be such as he was. Let us endeavor to follow him as he followed Christ. In 1786, John Wesley penned the only biography he ever wrote. It was called The Life of Fletcher and John William Fletcher became known as the Saint of Methodism. <laughs>